Alrighty then. So um, my name's Carl Binder, and uh, this is uh, Building Fluent Performance. And I put a different picture of me on the front there, I guess. <laughs> um, let me go to the slides and go to the next one. So here's the agenda. And uh, this is, this is, a, this is, I've been waiting for a long time to do this. Um, in a certain way, as you'll see, it's connecting the first 35 years of my professional career with the last 20 years. Um, because I spent a good portion of my early academic and then professional consulting career focused on what we call behavioral fluency. But it really started out with my having been a student with B.F. Skinner. And I want to take you guys through that a little bit, how we went from his measurement framework to uh, classroom and practical application in companies, originally in education and then in companies. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we refer to as fluency blockers and fluency builders, the things that we discovered in the early days, and then um, how we began to understand how that applies uh, in not only instruction originally for kids and in special needs environments and so forth, but then starting in the 80s in companies. And, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about designing efficient practice to build fluency because that's really what it's about and then talk talk a little bit about some case studies uh, and some results of those studies and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end this is a little bit of a nerdy presentation in the sense that i'm coming at this from a history of behavior science and um, so i'm hoping that it's okay from people's point of view but anyway uh before we get into it i just want to highlight a couple things uh, first of all of course our webinars and also other playlists and such um, uh, appear on performancethinking.tv, our YouTube channel, uh, generally about 36 to 48 hours after the webinar. So uh, you'll be able to, uh, you'll get a link uh, to the recording of this and you can uh, go to the website in any case, or the, excuse me, the YouTube channel. The other thing I want to highlight, and I'll be referring to this a few times, is fluency.org, which is not a website that I usually highlight for our audience of performance thinkers, but it is the place where the research kind of um, archives and a whole lot of publications related to this topic lives. So that may wind up being useful if you find this topic interesting. We've also got some more webinars coming. Uh, one of them is, uh, is really uh, focused on the role of management uh, in not only supporting productivity, but also engagement. One of the things that a lot of the um, performance uh, or, excuse me, employee engagement stuff often points out is that people really work for their managers. The, the, their managers and supervisors are the people who control the environments that they work in. And so we want to sort of shift the focus around employee engagement to what managers and leaders need to do to be sure people stick around and are happy. Uh, we want to talk about the word systemic when it applies to performance interventions. Uh, that's often used, the word systemic. It means a lot of things to people. We have a particular framework that I think you'll find useful, and so we plan to do a webinar on that. And then, of course, the whole issue about why training often doesn't deliver. Uh, that's a whole other topic. I also want to make an announcement that I'm very excited about. I just did a, a, a video uh, film yesterday that will get edited eventually with my friend and colleague, Dennis Murphy. And Dennis is a remarkable uh, fellow. He was uh, he went to the Naval Academy. He ultimately uh, he served in the in the Navy uh, for an entire career and was ultimately a commodore in the nuclear submarine Navy, which meant that he had six nuclear submarines reporting to him. He spent time early in his career as a as a fellow in the White House, um, but he was recruited by Amgen and worked there for I think more than fifteen years. Uh, ultimately as vice president of business performance. And so he was a big supporter of our work starting over a decade ago at Amgen, which is our longest uh, and biggest client. They have something like 300 certified performance thinking practitioners around the globe. And uh, Dennis has recently retired from Amgen and going into his third, I guess his third career uh, as a consultant. He's opened Bridgeview Associates, he will be consulting. He they gave him the hard problems at Amgen. He he did big transformational things, but he also pulled together um, operations, learning, and performance, process improvement, knowledge management, essentially the things that live in the six boxes model to support performance. And so he will be providing, I think, strategic uh, level consulting to a very senior executives in big companies. 
and we'll be working with him, of course, to put in place uh, practitioners, we hope, and people who can actually uh, implement performance thinking. So anyway, I'm real excited about this. You'll hear more about it in the future. I want to I talk a little bit about the history of this, because this really, what we're going to talk about today really does come out of a very, very long history. And this is my personal history. Every time I reflect on the fact that it was exactly 50, 50 years ago, almost to the week, that I began work in uh, for my uh, for Beatrice Barrett, who ran a laboratory where I worked for 10 years. And I'd been sent there by my professor at Harvard, B.F. Skinner. And so really, I started out with B.F. Skinner as my professor in uh, experimental psychology doctoral program at Harvard. And he sent me to Barrett. And Dr. Barrett had a human operant conditioning behavior press, uh, laboratory where a lot of research, basic research went on. But she also had a classroom. And she asked me to take what you'll see as Skinner's measure into our classroom because it was done very well with programmed instruction, classic, extremely well-designed instructional procedures for people with various handicaps, uh, people living in an institution, actually. And I spent 10 years there doing our research and development, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we discovered. And then in 1982, I started Precision Teaching and Management Systems, which was intended to bring this technology and the, what we learned in the corporate world. And we did a bunch of work with bankers and some other kinds of companies. And then we founded Product Knowledge Systems in 1992, which was a joint venture with the information mapping uh, company. And we delivered fluency-based training and practice along with um, a whole set of other things to major corporations. We were involved in launches at places like uh, Genentech and Microsoft and Oracle and so forth, big product launches. And the, the goal there was to enable salespeople to literally be fluent in speaking about what they had to speak about, asking questions, et cetera, with their, uh, with their prospects and clients. I left uh, Product Knowledge Systems in 97, 98 and founded Binder Re Associates, where we began to apply the very same things in call centers, as you'll see. And we also developed a fluency building workshop, which was a workshop we would take into big companies like Amazon and AT&T Wireless, train their trainers about how to do fluency based instruction and practice, and then help them do it. And you'll see some of the results from that. And then since 2005, the accomplishment based performance improvement methodology that we began to explore really in the early 80s uh, has come to fruition. And that's what we're doing now, of course. So what I'm really doing in a certain sense with this um, webinar and also with what we're going to be doing at our Summer Institute this year is bringing together these two parts of my history in a way that I hope will be very useful to people. Um, so it, it does start with B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner, as you may or may not know, was considered the most um, influential psychologist and behavior scientist of the 20th century. And I had the good fortune of studying with him in the doctoral program uh, toward the end of his career. And so I got to know a lot about Dr. Skinner's work, and he was a friend and mentor of mine for some years until he passed. But in 1968, um, he was asked in an interview, a little book by a man named Richard Evans, uh, of all the important contributions you've made, which do you feel are most significant? Now, people that know about Skinner or behaviorism or any of that at any level usually think, oh, that would be about reinforcement or discrimination learning or schedules of reinforcement or shaping, or all these discoveries that he and his protégés made over the decades. But he said the most important contribution, he would say, was the use of rate responding as the basic datum and the so-called cumulative record, which was a tool that he used to, to graphically display changes in in uh, rate of response. Now, rate of response is simply amount, number of responses or behaviors over time. So that's a pretty big deal because as in many air, uh, uh, fields of science, Skinner really invented or created or discovered a new natural science based on a new measurement technology. And so we start from there. And one of his protégés, uh, Dr. Ogden Lindsley, got his PhD with Skinner in the 50s and started a human laboratory, uh, and subsequently in the 60s, uh, moved from basic laboratory research at Harvard Medical School uh, to Kansas University, where he created the, the graph you see in front of you, which is called the standard acceleration chart. It was originally called the standard behavior chart to be used by teachers. And these were people who didn't have backgrounds in behavior science, but what Lindsley was doing is bringing Skinner's measure into the classroom, as you can see up the left, count per minute, rate of response. 
And Dr. Lindsley was my mentor and friend for about 30 years. And so he was highly influential uh, for me. And in the early days, I spent about a decade doing research in the application with mostly special education teachers, therapists, physical therapists, and so forth, using this measure. And toward the end of the 80s, uh, he said, uh, you should take what we've done and take it into business. So he was a very important contributor, bringing this measure, rate of response, into the classroom. And then there was Beatrice Barrett. And when I finished my coursework at Harvard, I was interested in working with people rather than in an animal laboratory. And so Dr. Skinner made some calls and contacted some people. And I wound up in the laboratory uh, with B. Barrett. And B had also done a postdoc with Skinner and with Lindsley in their laboratory. And she created her own laboratory. And you can see her in that uh, basic research laboratory. And she made a big point because she also had a classroom. And in that classroom, they did really good programmed instruction, sort of frame by frame, step by step instruction, using all the best things from the program instruction and instructional systems world. But she also, of course, because she had a laboratory in the lineage of B.F. Skinner, understood about rate of response. And she said, I thought a really cool thing back in the early 2000s in a book that she wrote called The Technology of Teaching Revisited, that behavior occurs in time. It takes time to occur and it occurs through time. Time is therefore a fundamental parameter of behavior. And this will be important when we start to consider how we measure um, how we measure performance and learning in educational and training settings. And then another of my mentors, who was actually my PhD advisor, Eric Houghton, was also a protege of Skinner and Lindsley and a good friend of B. Barrett. And I worked with him uh, from the early 70s. Uh, and um, he sadly died prematurely in the 80s. But he said a similar thing. He said, you can take behavior out of time as you can ignore the time dimension. But you can't take time out of behavior because it's an actual characteristic of people's behavior. So at some point, after I'd been working with Dr. Barrett for about a year, she had a classroom and she asked me to go into that classroom and to take it over and to begin to see what happened if we started looking at rate of response. And so what I'm about to take you through is the discoveries we made. And those discoveries were what we then called ceilings on performance. They were, they were limitations on performance that we learned about by using Skinner's measure. And then we learned how to sort of fix and they were measurement defined. That is, if you don't measure the time dimension, you can't even see the difference between mastery and beginner level performance, as you'll see in some data I will share with you. Uh, and then we learned that our procedures and our materials limited uh, learners' ability to respond quickly at their own pace. And so that was a huge change. And it's a really very relevant to how we currently do adult training in many environments. And then there were um, so called a deficit imposed. Um, things which are ceilings which we what we discovered there was when we enabled our learners to move at their own pace they still often and these were handicapped learners in that case but we learned that there were missing components that held people down that they were not able to do component behavior as quickly uh as as um as they needed to. And so if they couldn't, then there was this problem because uh, they would not be able to perform up to uh, speed. And I see Elizabeth Houghton here too, who's first grade classroom I did a, my dissertation in, <laughs> again, 40 some years ago. And then finally handicap defined in the case of our students then, what we recognized was some individuals simply didn't, were not able to move quickly enough. And in terms of the performance thinking world, and I'm not sure how familiar all of you are and I'm not going to overview performance thinking and its models, but one of the models we use is the six boxes model. And so if you translate what we learned back in the laboratory, we realized, first of all, if we didn't set expectations and feedback based on sensitive measurement, we couldn't even see the difference between expertise and, and beginner level. And then if we created materials and procedures, in other words, tools and resources, basically box two in the six boxes model that limited that slowed down, that imposed ceilings on performance, that was a problem. But once we did that, we recognized that there were component skills and knowledge that were not fluent. And once we recognized that, we then discovered in those days, at least with some of our uh, individual students, that there was capacity issues, that they really weren't able to move quickly or you know, these were people who were cognitively and physically disabled. Thankfully, with adult learners, we don't usually have that problem, but this was sort of the progression. And I wanna kind of take you through this. 
We subsequently, by the way, instead of talking about ceilings, which were the notion of hitting some top level on a graph of performance where you couldn't go any higher, we wound up calling these fluency blockers and fluency builders. So you'll see me going back and forth between that language. The first one was, and this is a these are, this is a report you'll see it's C Binder Behavior Prosthesis Lab. We had a, a a monthly newsletter that we sent out, and this is actually from that as we began to discover these things. And what we recognized first, as soon as we went into the classroom and started looking at the time dimension, we realized that with only percent correct measures. Uh, when you ignore the time dimension, in other words, you cannot tell the difference between levels of proficiency. And let me show you some data. These are some data that we collected using Skinner's measure. As you can see up the left there, it says movements or responses per minute. And we had three groups and, and they were, you can see the bars in the thing. There were uh, state school students. They were our, in our classroom and they were between their chronological ages, so-called, were between 12 and 54 years old. And uh, they were severely handicapped. They lo lived in institutions and we were trying to teach them uh, sight reading, uh, basic math skills, time telling, sort of vocational and pre-academic skills. And then we had some little kids between five and seven years old in public schools and they were normal, they were very young. And then we had some professional adults who had master's degrees and were doctoral students and so forth. And what you can see, if you look across the top, these were small bits of behavior, small skills that we were working on in our classroom, like putting pegs in a pegboard or copying strokes like dashes, circles, and so forth, writing components, in other words, copying numerals zero to nine, writing ones, zeros, dashes, sevens, fours, and nines, which are all of different complexity, uh, naming pictures, saying the names of pictures laid out in an array, uh, naming numerals, random numerals on a page that you could read as fast as you could. Uh, wrote counting, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, like that. Um, putting tiles into a can, which is a fine motor movement, and then doing that while counting, counting tiles into a can, counting out tiles or on a table, and then counting out tiles from a set, moving them. So these are really basic skills. And this was all correct responding. And so if you look at these, you will see that this is, again, count per minute. In almost all of these cases, the professional adults with the dark black bars had higher frequencies. Than, this was 30 second timings, by the way, than all or most of the little kids, than all or most of the handicapped students, the, the people who were in our classroom. And so this is what you'd kind of expect. If you saw these people in a room, if you uh, watched them walking across the playground, if you did almost anything, you'd sort of say, yep, that kind of makes sense. That kind of sorts out the difference in capability between these three groups of people. Now, uh, I don't think there's enough people here to do this in a way that we'll get a good sample, but I was going to suggest, actually, maybe we should do it anyway and see what happens. Um, uh, if you look at this page and I give you 30 seconds, uh, I would like you to just say to yourself, and you can say it out loud wherever you're sitting or whisper it to yourself, the answers. So like the first one, zero plus five, just say five, eight, seven, seven, like that. And say it as fast as you can. And I will give you a 30 second timing and then put your finger when you get to the end. And if you get to the end and start over again, that's fine. But notice how far you got and then count up how many you got and double it. So is everybody ready? Okay, please begin. Say those answers. Fast as you can. Please stop. Now take a moment to see how, fa how far you got. Count up the number of answers that you got in 30 seconds. So I'll give you a moment to do that. And then double whatever that number is. And that will give you the number of answers, the number of responses you made per minute. Now I just wanna make a little prediction. Which is, I would bet that everybody in this group was someplace between probably 50 or 60 and 100 or 110 a minute. 
Now, maybe if anybody wants to respond in the chat room to see if that's, let me know if that's true or not. Um, what we can say about this is that like on the previous slide, there are objective measures of competence when you look at the time dimension. But notice that if we use the measurement framework that we use from elementary school through graduate school, which is percent correct, you would not be able to tell the difference. You would not be able to tell a difference in skill on any of these simple component behaviors between a person who is severely handicapped living in an institution and a person with a graduate degree. Now, that's a really big deal. Because what that means is that our entire education system and most of our training programs are running blind. We cannot tell the difference between mastery and beginning or even handicap level performance. Now, uh, Dr. Julie Skinner Vargas said in a book of hers in 77, a really, I thought, telling thing about education, and it applies just as well to training. She says, teaching is not only producing new behavior. It's also changing the likelihood that a student will respond in a certain way. Since we cannot see a likelihood, we look at how frequently a student does something. We see how fast he can add. The student who does, does problems correctly at a higher rate is said to know addition facts better than one who does them at a lower rate. Now, Skinner, when he started using rate of response as a measure, he recognized it was the most sensitive measure we have of human behavior. And that's all that... His daughter, actually, was an important contributor in her own right, said. So time matters. And if you stand back from what I've been saying and just think about the world that you might work in, uh, people in customer call centers have to move quickly. They have to know what they're doing. They have to find their way around systems so that they can provide solutions per hour. Or software developers need to be able to code quickly and efficiently. Or playing a musical instrument or dancing has time built into it or writing and editing documents. If we're lucky, we're fast writers. If we're not, it's really hard work. Or making technical decisions on the spot. I've been reading a lot about Elon Musk lately. And one of the things that the people that worked with him just find is stunning is how quickly he can make good technical decisions right on the spot. Or responding to customer objections in a call center and so on. Time matters, uh, but we don't think about it. On the other hand, the word fluency, as we've developed it over the years, can be thought of as accuracy plus speed. You gotta get it right and you gotta be quick. Some things it's not just about speed though, like playing a musical instrument or writing your name. It's about the quality of the response as well as the pace. So sometimes you can go too fast on some things, but there's an appropriate time dimension pace and there's an appropriate level of quality or rate of correct responding, of course. Or if you're just doing things one at a time, like doing the right thing without hesitation, you know, intervening in a discussion at the appropriate point if there's an argument going on, uh, you know, playing basketball and being able to turn and shoot at the right place and so forth. Some people talk about automaticity or second nature response. But in the end, fluency is what we would call true mastery. It's the measure of performance of competent, capable people. And we can think about levels of performance, starting with at the bottom with no ability to perform at all. And then beginner's level, which is where a lot of training programs leave us, where we're sort of inaccurate, you know, we're making some mistakes, kind of, you know, a little hesitant and we're slow. And then historically, there was a big argument among a lot of um, uh, educational and training people about mastery learning. And what they meant was perfect accuracy. And there was always an argument about, oh, can we expect people to be 100% correct or is that too stringent or whatever? But if you reflect on what I've been saying, you realize that's not enough. You can be perfectly accurate, but if you're too slow, you're not going to be able to do whatever you need to do well. So what we talk about is true mastery as being accurate and quick. And as the title to this webinar talks about, that's a combination of ergonomics, that is the design of the materials in the environment, and practice. So let's drill into this a bit, because what we learned as the first thing was without measuring the time dimension, we could not even see what it meant to be masterful. So then we started measuring the time. We started seeing how many things our students could do per unit time, whether it was math facts or sorting things or completing problems or reading or whatever it was, putting on their shirt for that matter. You know, and what we recognized was immediately 
that the procedures and the materials often slowed people down because we hadn't even been thinking about the time dimension. So as again, I wrote in 78, we're developing methods and materials for moving from teacher controlled trials procedures to student paced tasks so that students could move as quickly as they could. And this is some slightly nerdy data, but this is from our classroom. And this is count per minute at the left. And what you'll see is that there are the black dots are correct responses. The, the red X's are mistakes or errors. And the blue uh, triangles are when we waited five seconds and there was no response when we went on. So there were skips. And so what you see is in this program instruction kind of framework, people were, the teachers were working with students until they got accurate two out of three sessions in a row, and then they go on to the next words and the next words and the next words. And this is classically not only how special education was and regular education often was done, but if you think about adult training, we often have materials and procedures, including e-learning, that slow people down. On the other hand, we changed materials here. We moved from using flashcards and one-at-a-time prompts to arrays of words and worksheets. And just by changing those materials, we doubled performance. In other words, we allowed our students to move quickly. And what you can see is if the graph kept going, they were accelerating because they now could practice at their own pace. So this was a huge, huge insight. And it really was a kind of a duh moment. It's like, oh my God, I cannot believe this. This is not about our students being incapable. It's about our materials and procedures holding them back. Now, that's not to say that we were able, able to get all of those students in our institutional learning center up to competent adult levels, but it does say that many of the issues that we encounter with them, as well as for adult training, for that matter, have to do with materials and procedures that are constraining, that are fluency blockers. So we spent a lot of time on this. And in our world, the world of adult training and performance for example, you look at a lot of e-learning programs and they don't move very quickly and they don't respond very quickly uh, to, uh, to, they don't let you move very quickly. Not always, but a lot of them are like that and they slow you down. And so we need to have more examples, more opportunities. I, I'm a football fan and I watch, uh, I watch Seahawks football in Seattle and I listen to uh, and watch uh, um, press, press conferences with coaches and so forth. I always talk about reps you know, uh, athletes talk about reps, uh, weightlifters talk about reps, R repetitions. And so the idea is for practice, if you think about it, we need more examples and opportunities. And then we have to teach our learners to practice on their own. And in the case of those handicapped students that we had decades ago, those were students who'd been so controlled that in order to get them to respond again, you often had to prompt them. Now with adults, when, as you'll see, we work with salespeople and call center people and so forth. With adults, you often have to give them materials and a way to practice on their own and measure their own performance and see their own improvement. So we have to enable people to do self-managed practice. And then we have to look at the ergonomics. In a lot of software systems and a lot of materials and reference systems, the user interfaces are just very constraining. Or the tools that we give people, the software, or access to reference materials. I'm a big fan of the information mapping structured documentation method. And one of the beauties about that methodology is it takes complex information, it makes it easy to find and then easy to use when you get there. So you have to remove the blockers in the environment that are slowing people down. And we literally did spend years thinking about this. And in fact, I see Elizabeth Houghton is here who is a teacher of children and has been approaching, approaching education with kids for. 50 years or so using the time dimension. And uh, we were friends back then too. And we spent a lot of time coming up with clever ways to practice fine motor skills, to practice counting skills, academic skills, you name it. So once we changed our materials and procedures, then as I wrote again in 78, once we enable students to work at their own pace, we observed that after an initial jump up, as you saw in that one graph, they often fail to accelerate to the ranges that we would expect or that the levels that we need them to be at. So what's that about? Well, that's when I read the, the second most important publication in my career, which was from the late Eric Houghton called Aims Growing and Sharing. And in that article in 1972, he showed, and we, you can download it at fluency.org if you're interested. He showed that uh, if we don't build things like writing with kids, 
writing digits, reading digits, um, uh, you know, the components of, of larger chunks, that it slows people down. So if I'm asking you as a, let's say in math, if I'm asking you as a young student to write answers to math facts, but your writing skills are not fluent, it's going to slow you way down. So we probably need to work on that. Or if I'm asking you even a bigger chunk to do story problems, so-called, which are the bane of kids and uh, their parents sometimes when it's homework. You know, if the kid can't read fluently, if they can't write numbers, if they can't add, if they can't form equations, there's all these components that if you can't do some or all of them fluently, then it holds the whole thing down. So we began to recognize, oh my gosh, there's components that are missing. And this is from that article. This is, a, I think, a brilliant summary of this because what this is is a correlation. And across the bottom are saying sounds in words. So in other words, looking at a bunch of components of words and saying, you know, the full and so forth. And then those are components of actually reading words, which is what's up the left. And each dot re there represents one student with the intersection of their ability to do the component with the composite. And you see an extremely tight correlation. So that suggests, as a lot of other work that we've done for 50 years suggests, that you must build the component frequencies to, to lift the ceilings on being able to apply it, what we call application. And so if you stand back again and think about it, look at your own performance that you're working with, with your clients and with the people you train, there's a lot of chained behavior that we do one thing and then another thing and another thing. Well, sometimes you don't have to work on all of it to practice. Sometimes they're just little pieces like decisions or certain adjustments or small components that you need to break out in practice or discriminations in skilled movements. So for example, if I'm teaching an airline pilot to navigate, I probably need to get that person really good at looking at all the dials and data in front of them so they can quickly make decisions and then do that. Or coordinated movements of multiple components. This is always obvious in things like musical performance or using complex machinery or uh, you know doing acrobatics for that matter. That there's a bunch of components that you have to be able to do at the same time in a coordinated way to be successful. And then there's a great deal in academic and uh, professional life of associations. So for example, when we were working with um, bankers and then subsequently salespeople in lots of industries, one of the things that salespeople need to be able to do is once they've identified the needs or problems that a customer says they have, they need to be able to fairly quickly say, well, these are the features of our product or service that will help you. And let me tell you about how. Now that's an association. That's a link. And if you don't have that component from problem or need to solution, kind of just in the back of your mind, so to speak, then you're going to have a hard time doing that. And we often ask salespeople to figure that stuff out rather than providing them practice. So in component, what we call component analysis, we're looking at whole part relationships and behavior. We're looking at some people call tool skills and basic skills or elements and compounds. Um, Dr. Houghton, uh, Eric Houghton had, a, I think, a beautiful analogy with chemistry. He pointed out that in chemistry, elements come together um, to form compounds when those elements have the right valence, if anybody remembers chemistry. And what he said is, you know, component behaviors or elements of behavior like fine and gross motor skills come together when they are sufficiently fluent to form a larger chunk. So if you think about a baby developing, you know, reaching uh, body movements of all kinds, when certain components become sufficiently fluent, then it's possible for that kid to put them together and crawl or walk or what have you. So this is how we think about the components. And it's not often thought of, I don't think that way, in adult instructional design. We also discovered, once that was there, uh, what we call endurance. And that was really what my dissertation was about. And I don't want to go into it in great detail, but this is an example of some data. This was, if you look up the left, this is count per minute. And this is very simple number skills. I believe it was uh, uh, um, writing numbers uh, by a certain sequence. And if you look across the bottom, it's 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, 16 minutes. So a pretty big range. Now, what you see is that the individuals who could do that for maybe 20 a minute for 15 seconds, by the time you got to 16 minutes, there was hardly any behavior left. But once you got to about 80 or 90 a minute for 15 seconds, you could continue more or less at that pace for quite a while. And of course, we all know this. We just never thought about it until we saw these data, I think, which is that 
you know, if you're learning a new piece of software or if you're learning almost anything new, you know, within a little time when you're first struggling with it, you kind of want to get a cup of coffee or go to the bathroom or hope the phone rings because, because you're fatigued. It's just like running the marathon, you know, until you get so you really have endurance and can run for quite a while. But initially with things like wind sprints and so forth, you can't, you, you know, at mile 20, you're in pretty rough shape. But if you have endurance, you can continue. And so we began to understand that there's a relationship between being able to do things quickly and easily for short intervals and being able to continue that. And there's a whole lot more data there. You can find a lot of it on fluency.org. But that was a big discovery because it affected how we design practice. And if we do design for practice, what we do is we say, first of all, start with, sh- with sprints. It might seem nuts, but if we have, let's say, a customer service person or a call center person or a person doing uh, maintenance activities, give them bursts of practice that they have to be very high paced to achieve a goal, but maybe only a half a minute to a minute at a time, and then begin to lengthen those practice exercises as the pace of their performance increases. And also be sure to build the components before application. It is a classic thing to you know throw people in the deep end discovery learning so so called and in fact one of my first encounters with that was when we were working with salespeople we were, we were working with bankers and when banks were deregulated uh, uh, loan officers had to learn how to sell things and so some colleagues of mine developed a very good sales training program but it didn't have any fluency practice in it and so what would happen is they'd read a bunch about the industry and a bunch about the situation and then they'd be given a case study and the case study was a big chunk, you know, a, a kind of complicated. And they were s- supposed to kind of solve this, you know, come up with what the solutions are for this customer. And, you know, people struggled with it a little bit. And then we introduced fluency building on components, on needs and solutions, on industry trends, on a whole bunch of stuff that were components of what people would need to do in order to analyze a customer situation and come up with a proposal. And when these young bankers got fluent on that. After the second case study, they said to the trainers, you know, we don't really need this anymore. It's pretty easy. And so we were able to make big chunks much easier by ensuring that the critical components were fluent. So I think sprinting and long distance running is kind of a good metaphor for this, because that's really what we're talking about. It's like getting quick for short intervals and then continuing. So there's a bunch of articles here. Um, uh, you can get them all at fluency.org. There's also a bunch of files that I will just make available to you if you want to download them. I don't want it to be a distraction, but uh, uh, there's a bunch of articles here, one of which is this early article that we published in banking in 1989. And these are the kinds of data that we got in the article. We What we discovered was we provide a whole bunch of practice, and then we used multiple choice tests, which are typically really insensitive. Multiple choice tests, you know, you guess and so forth. But if I give you a multiple choice test that has 40 items on it and only give you three minutes to do it, what that means is you're going to very quickly find the ones you know, and you know them for sure. It's not like you're guessing. You're you're like that. You might skip the ones that you have no idea about. But when you get fluent, it's not about guessing and figuring out which ones are obviously wrong and so forth. You just know the answers. You go, so a timed multiple choice test test is actually very sensitive. And what you see is in these two banks, they went from being like a five a minute, correct, to 16 a minute, which means if you think about it, you translate that into how long it takes you to respond. They went from taking about eight seconds to respond to a very simple item to under four seconds. And then at the other bank, they went from about nine seconds to under four seconds. Now, under four seconds is enough time to sort of clear your throat and then respond. But nine seconds is like awkward silence. And so we began to see that we could actually not only measure, but also build uh, fluency in these folks. We then got involved subsequently at Bindery Associates in taking what we learned with bankers into customer call centers. And that's a very interesting environment because I don't know if any of you are involved in that world, but uh, in that world, you... um, uh, you know, you not only have to use usually a whole bunch of computer systems, and you have to have a lo- lot of information at the tip of your tongue, solutions to problems, answers about products, and so forth. But you also often have people yelling in your ear. 
And so we had a bigger range of things to build fluency on. And I was lucky to have as my co-author for this publication and my client, Lee Sweeney, who was the business unit manager, but he was also a, a, an athletic coach. So he got this stuff. And here's an example. We had customer service representatives. This is six different people. Uh, they were working on practice cards, basically, in this case, about billing rates, which is some stuff they need to know about billing, some sales promotion content that they need to be able to respond to, and then some product features. And what you see is each of these dots represents one person's timing and their count per minute frequency. And then this is over a couple of weeks. And so on any given day, we had five or six performers and we just put them all in the same graph. So what you see is these people, for example, went from like, let's say, uh, 10 or 15 or 20 a minute at the beginning of one week to almost 100 a minute. And actually, these little green ranges are what we identified as being the range of competent performance based on sort of experts, testing experts. And so we this is a tripling of performance per week with just a little bit of daily practice. And all we really did with these people is, is made a big deal every time they improved. So their personal best, it's like, anybody else, anybody get better than they got last time? And people like, yeah, you get excited. And so what we saw is even just a few minutes of practice every day over spread over a week, a couple of weeks, and just celebrating personal best could make an enormous impact. And the effect that that had on the business, this is calls per hour. So this is actual performance on the job of how many solutions can you provide per hour to your customers? Now, the benchmark um, was something like five to seven calls per hour to be able to complete. And what you see here is two groups. The, 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 the squares, the open squares, were the people who were trained in the conventional methodology without any fluency practice. And they not only didn't, you know, they're... They, they sort of hit five or four per, per hour, something like that. But they actually decelerated a little bit after they first got on the job. Whereas the black dots, which were um, the people that we trained with fluency-based instruction and practice, they, they accelerated really fast. And ultimately, they beat performance of the benchmark by 60%. The ultimate story here is that it took, it used to take two months to get a new customer service rep up to benchmark productivity levels, according to the management of that at t call center, we reduced it to two weeks. And you can imagine that blew the minds of managers. Um, and what we heard, one of the things we did at at t was we asked people after the training, like, what was that like? And we asked people, their managers, and they said, well, it felt more like a gym than a classroom because there was a lot of short bursts of activity and practice. And we were kind of training at work speed instead of sort of coddling people. We were saying, hey, you got to move it here. And they all said it was never dull. And I don't know how many of you have ever participated in eight hours a day of training for a week or two. But usually people come out kind of, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty fuzzy headed at the end of the day. These young people were coming out of their training all cranked up and excited, enthusiastic and confident. In fact, it's funny because it was in a call center and the other trainee, the other call center reps who'd been trained before, they, a bunch of them said, wait a minute, I don't know what you're doing in there, but I, we want that. You know, we want to, we want what they got. And so removing this whole thing of removing component deficit imposed ceilings, you want to identify the components of a larger hunk of performance that actually will slow people down. And in the call center environment, we discovered, I think, an important thing, which was that, I don't know, again, if any of you have been involved in call centers, but uh, one of the things that often happens in customer call centers is people work a lot on product knowledge and so forth, and they do a little bit of practice with their systems. And usually they've got more than one system to interact with, computer system, but they don't really time it. They don't really focus on the components. They just kind of say, well, I'll take 20 minutes and do a scavenger hunt. What we did was we would do things like say, okay, we want people to be able to get into account uh, people's, you know, customers' accounts and extract information so they can respond quickly to questions. And so we would do things like give people give people maybe thirty different things to find in the system, and we'd pair people up. You say, find John Doe's account number. Huh? Okay, good. Uh, and these guys would pair up and they'd move as quickly as they could, and they practiced components like that or changing information, small pieces using the system 
Some of them even said they dreamt about the system after the first week of practice. But the point is they got really fluent. And what, what I believe is that the reason we were able to take that from taking almost two months to get up to speed to two weeks was because we lifted the ceiling that was related to getting up to, up to speed on the system. They were fluent on the system from day one. And so they were able to move really quickly toward competent interactions with people. So we identified the non-fluent components. We then estimate ranges by, t- by getting some successful performers, giving them the practice activities, letting them repeatedly practice with those a little bit so they kind of understood how it all worked and get those frequencies and use those as the goals or the aims for practice. That was at least a good place to start. And the other thing is, so you don't sort of drag people down energy wise. You get them fluent on the components before you ask them to do big hunks, because what you can do then is you can sort of engineer discovery learning. You can put people into a case study where all the components are fluent. So it's fun to solve the problem rather than difficult. So those are general principles about removing the ceilings. I'm going to try to play something if you can't. So this is a, this was an interview that was done with uh, Ray Charles many years ago. And I'm going to see if I can play this in a way that you guys can hear it. Um, let's see here. Play the video. Losing you. You practice a lot? Whenever I can. I don't, I don't practice as much as I, I, as I would like to because I'm not around a big piano all the time. Mm-hmm. But I try to, you know, I try to practice a little bit, uh, Every day, for the most part. And when you practice, I mean, do you, do you practice the the tunes that you'll be playing at the next concerts? Or oh old no, things no, 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 no. I, I guess I the answer is no. You're saying no, no. I I practice things like uh, scales and chords and movement of my hands and things like that. Because I mean, I, what, what I'm going to play on stage, I know. I want to. What I be. What, what I'm practicing for is to try to improve what I might play. You know, you, you got to practice. I mean, you got to keep your fingers loose. You got to keep your mind active, you know, because what your mind think of, the question is what your mind think of, can your fingers play it? Right. <laughs> uh, so, so I love that particular, um, just a second here. I love that very much because, um, it makes obvious that somebody who is a master at something that's a very complex performance definitely understood uh, how to practice. Um, you know, Sam Sneed, who most people probably don't even know who he was, but he was kind of the Tiger Woods of his day. He was a three-time PGA golf champion. And he said, I practice as much as anyone. For years, I hit 500 balls a day. There's no such thing as natural talent. There's natural ability, but talent comes only after relentless practice and fine-tuning. Now, one might ask, how did you practice 500 balls a day. Did you do 500 holes of golf? Well, no, of course not. What you did is you got buckets of balls. So you changed the materials and procedures so you could move quickly at that particular important component. So when you design effective practice, there's a classic argument about practice. People call it drill and kill. But if you think about it, whether it was, you know, in the third grade on math facts or something that is an adult, most, a lot of so-called practice does not have an explicit goal that has a time dimension, is often pretty long durations, 10, 15, 20 minutes where you have endurance issues. And often people are working on these big chunks before they're fluent on the components. So if you have explicit time-based goals and recognize personal bests and improvement against those goals, if you work on sprints in the beginning, short peak performance intervals, and then you build those elements, this elements fluency before you ask people to put them all together, it works pretty darn well and people like it. Here's another one. I was working with a medical devices company some years ago and I was talking to Tim Deere, who was a surgeon, and he said, having good hands is the primary determinant of a surgeon's success in the operating room. That means that he or she can complete surgical procedures quickly, smoothly, and correctly for both medical and financial success. Surgeons in training practice uh, make sutures, for example, by using cadavers, tomatoes, or pig's feet until they can do them quickly and effortlessly. Now, I should mention, this might go a few minutes over the hour, and I apologize for that. You will get the recording if you have to drop off, and I will not be offended. But one of the things is that in the last probably five or six years, I wound up connecting up with Marty Levy, who's a 
wonderful human. And he's a dog trainer also, but he's the head of orthopedic residency at the Montefiore Medical Center, which is the which is associated with the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And he has applied what we're talking about to training orthopedic surgeons. And it's made all the difference because the traditional way of training orthopedic surgeons has been to show them once or twice, have them do it, and frankly, beat them up until they get it right. That's how Marty describes it. But instead, he works on the components of using saws and sutures and all these components until they're really fluent at them. And when they put them together, it's a piece of cake. So if you stand back from this, one of the things we've learned from this is that in any given training program or design, there really needs to be three stages. There's an initial stage, which is most of what most people do in training, which is initial learning, acquiring new skills and knowledge to accuracy or quality. And that's important. But then you need to work on the components to build fluency and endurance before you combine them in application. And that sequence is seldom used. Um, here's a typical hour at at t Wireless, the fluency-based practice, where you can just skim this. But what you can see is that these were all little short minutes of different kinds of spoken and other practice activity with very little lecture in them. They were, they were moving quickly in this in small bits. It looked much more like a learning gym. And it shifted how we spent time. Because if you traditionally, if you look at the way most training happens, and I confess to doing a lot of it this well, myself, most of it is kind of lecture stuff. And typically, people also have watching tenured people, which is not really a very effective learning methodology in most ways. And then review and look at job aids a little bit. And then, of course, typical instruction has almost no fluency practice or none that's explicit. And then some on-the-job training. Well, the big difference, as you can see, is dramatic reduction in classroom lecture. Forget about the watching tenured, perform tenured performance. Do some practice on job aids, but most of the time, more than half the time spent on practice. And that's what produces those kind of results. So, for example, at Toronto Dominion Bank, when we introduced these, we talked to, after the program that had happened, we talked to experienced bankers. And they said, you know, these kids, they know this stuff better than I do. I've been selling this stuff for five years. Or Genentech, which is a biotech firm that we did product launches for for years. And they got to the point where if there weren't fluency materials involved, they didn't even think of it as training. I used to have these sales guys in competitive environments where they had to be fluent responding to questions. It was fun, but man, they were rambunctious. Let's put it that way. Um, as I mentioned at AT&T Wireless, we were able to shorten their onboarding process from two months to two weeks. And then they surpassed their benchmark by 60%, which just blew the minds of the business people. And although people at amazon.com will actually give me the data, in the early 2000s, I worked with their customer service folks in North Dakota is where a bunch of the calls, one of the call centers was. And I taught them how to build this kind of stuff. And then they implemented it. And I went back a little bit later to the, my client. I said, well, how did that do? What happened? And she said, wow, we're Amazon. We can't share the data with you. But I'll tell you what, we promised our managers that if they'd fund you coming in, it, we'd at least hit a productivity improvement of 25%. They said, we way more than did that. So we've made a big difference in applying this in different environments. This is a little bit nerdy, but there's a publication you can find on fluency.org that's by me in 1996, where I summarized all this stuff. And I was surprised to learn a few years ago that the behavior analyst, which was the main sort of flagship publication of the uh, Association for Behavior Analysis International, went for 40 years, that this article was the 12th most cited publication in 40 years. So there's a lot of interest in that among applied behavior scientists. So here's some takeaways. First thing is, if you want to measure, if you want to get fluent performance, you got to measure it. You got to include the time dimension. Second thing is, once you've done that, you'll recognize you need more opportunities to respond. You need to redesign materials and procedures. This is the ergonomics part. And that's a really creative part because you got to figure out how to make your e-learning move quickly, how to provide let's say practice with the job aids that provides lots of opportunities, how to do things like practice cards and, and question and answer exercises and things that move quickly that allow lots of responses until people actually get measurably fluent. And then you got to look carefully and say, we don't practice everything. We look at the knowledge and skill components that slow people down if they're not kind of automatic and you focus on that. And then you figure out ways to enable self-paced self practice. One of the reasons that we've not done it so much in workshops in our own business right now, 
and we're moving toward a virtual blended kind of program, we're going to have more practice for people between sessions. But it's often difficult to get people to practice things in between formal training sessions. And that's really in about in early 80s when I got turned on to performance improvement and eventually developed from Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model, the six boxes model, because what we recognized was we can develop skills and knowledge. But we if we're going to have people actually practice on their own, we got to have their managers and supervisors set expectations. We got to give them a way to measure their performance so they get feedback. We need to we need to give them materials, tools, and resources that work quickly and that support fluency. We got to recognize fluency, and then we got to build fluent components. So, the last point about use performance thinking to ensure that they actually do it is a big deal. Um, we had a workshop for many years called the Fluency Building Workshop, and then we had a follow up one called Fluency Coaching. We've not done this for a long time um, and for various reasons that we could go into if people wanted to talk about it. But we hope over the next year or two to, to basically take the design aspects of this and turn it into online programs. But in the short term, at our annual Summer Institute, which we're going to be having the next one in June, the 12th, our 12th annual Summer Institute, um, which people love, and you can go online, uh, that rather awkward uh, URL at the top, bit.ly slash 223PT that for Performance Thinking Summer Institute. You can find information about it. But people have said for years, almost every year, that some people said this is the best professional development experience in my career, networking, great food, lots of new ideas. This year, for the first time ever, I'm going to be bringing the fluency building stuff into this context. It's the first time these two things are coming together, performance thinking. And so I'm excited about it. And so, and we're going to have a one day workshop on Monday of that week. That's a, it's a short and abbreviated version of how to do what I've been talking about. So this is something I usually don't do, but when this gets on YouTube, I would really appreciate it. If you would like and share and subscribe to our channel, it would make a big difference for us and it would give us a way to get this information out. And so here's some resources, and let me just see if there's any questions or comments in the chat box. So I'm just looking at the chat box here, and I want to see if anybody found this useful or interesting or has questions about it. The other thing I should mention is we do have our ongoing virtual practitioner program. As long as you're, if you're thinking about questions to ask, let me, let me fill some airspace here. We have our performance consulting certification program that's called the Performance Thinking Practitioner Program. And we run an open version of that three or four times a year, which just people can come one at a time from any place. We also run them inside if people have a team, like a training and development group that they want to turn into performance consultants. But our next open one starts April 3rd, and you can find out about it on the front page of performancethinking.com. And then my colleague, Shane Isley, who works in the Applied Behavior Analysis uh, sort of autism, special needs education world and consults the companies there, teaches our coaching and supervision program. And he's got an open program starting in March. And you can find out more about that on Facebook if you look up performance thinking on Facebook. So it looks to me like we don't have any questions. I Maybe I've sort of shut everybody down here. I really appreciate your participation. And uh, I hope you find it useful. And I think our time is up. So thank you very much, everyone.